Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. We have a saying here at the Wayward Outreach that once you watch once, you're now part of the family. We know that God is ready to do something amazing in your life, so check out today's service. You know, today we have a guest speaker, Gavin Tate, all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, and he's been blessing us all week long. Wednesday night, we had a sermon or a teaching on being close to Jesus Christ. And when we started that, that, ser that teaching, that sermon, I said to Gavin, we need to have you finish this sermon. So we just barely scratched the surface of it. And he spent a little time this week with the worship team and just showing them how to get into the presence of God. I really believe that this is going to be one of the most important messages you've ever heard in your life. So we know that spending time with God in prayer is important, but this is what happens to most of us. We don't know what to do when it's time to pray. So we just spend some time maybe saying a few prayer requests or thanking God for a few things, but we don't know how to enter into the presence of God. So Gavin today is going to show us practically how to do that. I was talking to Gavin. I go, Gavin, I know you spend time with God on a regular basis every day, but what do you do in your private time to get to know God? How do you experience the power of God or the presence of God when you pray? And he goes, there's practical ways to do this. And this is what's going to happen. Today, you're going to learn how to spend time with God and enjoy. There's a scripture in Hosea 6.3, and it says this. So let us know and become personally acquainted with him. Just think about that. We can become personally acquainted with him. That means it's a personal relationship we can have with him. And the scripture goes on to say, let us press on to know and understand fully the greatness of the Lord to honor, heed, and deeply cherish him. Well, did you want to get, get to the point that you deeply like cherish God more than you even do today? Well, we're going to learn how to do that. Our church is going to get on fire to a whole nother level. We're going to see our homes transform with the presence of God more than we've ever seen it. Get ready for miracles. Get ready for God to speak to you. So I got Gavin here and, and he's going to give us this word and get ready to take some notes. Are you guys ready to receive the word of God? Well, let's all stand up at home right now and let's give the Lord some praise and let's give Gavin Tate a welcome into your home right now. Gavin. Hey, hey, thank you so much, Pastor. We're so glad you're with us. Yes, yes. We're excited about this word and, 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 and I know that this is something that the Lord's been speaking to you about. Yeah. That you're saying, man, how come no one's talking about this? Right. And we've been so, I think this is the issue. We've been so interested in the hand of God and his blessings mm. that we've no longer have sought his face yeah. to know him. Right. So we've fallen in love with things you, that he's created, right. but we've not fallen in love with the creator. And that's what the season is all about, because if we're really going to introduce people to Jesus, yeah. we got to know him personally. Right. And if we're going to live this life, that means we're going to have to be in love with Jesus. So thank yes. you so much for sharing yes. with us. And we're excited about this work. God bless you. Love you. <laughs> love you. Love yes, you. Sir. Thank you so much. Just, uh, turn me just a little bit up here. Guys, I, I am so grateful to be able to come and to minister with you guys today and in your home. It's always an honor to bring the word. I never take it for granted. And I am uh, extremely excited to bring something that means so much to me. And, you know, the only place that we can find refuge in a time where things are going crazy is in the presence of God. And in the presence of God is our refuge. It's the only place of safety in a place where everything else seems to be going crazy. Job 28 verse 1, we're going to enter in with this today. And I want you to have your Bible out. I want you to be following along it's so important to have your Bible, whether you're at home, whatever it is. The Bible is the Logos. It is Jesus himself. Jesus became the Word. The Word became flesh, John chapter 1. When we read the Bible, we're having an interaction with Jesus. We're having an interaction with the person of Jesus. The Bible is God in paper. It is Jesus on paper. It is Logos. It is established forever in heaven. So you got to bring your Bible to church. you got to bring your Bible to your house. If you're having a watch party, wherever you're at with this, make sure you have it open, whether it's on your phone, whatever it might be. I want to read you this beautiful scripture about Jesus being our refuge. Job 28 verse 1. There is a mine for silver 
in a place where gold is refined. This is such an amazing picture, what I'm about to tell you here in Job. He's describing the secret place. There is a place that's mined for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from one. Mortals put an end to the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses for the ore in the blackest darkness. Far from human dwellings, they cut a shaft in places untouched by human feet. Far from other people, they dangle and sway. The earth from which food comes is transformed below by fire. Now watch this. Lapis lazuli comes from its rocks and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No bird of prey knows that hidden path no falcon's eye has seen it proud beasts do not set their foot on it and no lion prowls there there is a place that is hidden from the works of satan there is a place that he does not know the passcode to there is a door that shuts where all demonic influence and demonic power cannot enter in you will not be touched by the elements of the world by the elements of darkness because no fowl and no bird of prey that represents demonic activity even knows where the path is it's a secret it is the secret place no lion who's the lion well the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour no lion has ever even set foot there the secret place of the Most High is our protection in times when it's good, in times when it's crazy, in times where nothing makes sense, and in times where you're in lavish parts of your life and you're happy and joyful and everything's going your way. The secret place is the only hope we have for total survival, for total prosperity, for total success in our life. We have to be people who return. And on Wednesday, we talked about the first part about the importance of staying close to Jesus. And what I'm gonna to do today is finish that. I wanna talk about being close to Jesus. You know, the reason why you got saved wasn't necessarily for a church, even though I hope you have a great one. I hope you have a great community of believers that you can talk to and share things with and, and that it's precious to you. I hope you have that. I hope you have friendships. And if you don't, I pray them into your life in Jesus' name because they're so important to have. But you know, that's not the reason why you got saved. The reason why you got saved wasn't so that you could, you know, have a great marriage, even though I hope you have one. The reason why you got saved first was not so that you could serve on a worship team or that you could be a part of a ministry. All of these things are good and God wants us to do these, but the reason why you got saved was because of the pearl of great price. It was because of Jesus himself. It was because there was something worth searching for that you were searching for in your life and you didn't even know you needed it. You were trying to find it in women. Maybe you were trying to find it in drugs. Maybe you were trying to find it in alcohol. Maybe you were trying to search out and find it in happiness with more relationships. Maybe you were trying to search out and find it. You are on a search. Every person when they are born begins the search for God. They just don't know that's what they're searching for until they find him. But Jesus is that great pearl that was worth searching for. And when you found him, no matter how it was, whether it was in your room, whether it was at the altar of a church building, whether it was on the streets when somebody led you to the Lord, whatever it was, that was the reason why you got saved. And it is still the reason that we live. And now we have to move past just knowing him as a savior. And now he wants to become a friend. Now he wants to become a master and a Lord, a loving father, an intimate associate, you see, the Bible says that there is a koinonia, there is a genuine, uh, a genuine fellowship between us and the Holy Spirit who comes into you at salvation, who baptizes you in himself when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a whole nother subject. But man, if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're missing out on so many things of the power of God. But that comes upon you. And now you have this fellowship, this intimate union. Throughout the epistles, Paul talks about we are now in union with Jesus. We are now one with Christ. We are found in him. That means that we are so hidden and so no longer just ourselves that we have been found with a new identity. We look like Jesus. We walk into a place, the spirit realm sees Jesus. 
we walk into the heavenlies. The Bible says, we'll read today, that we have equal access as Jesus. So heaven sees us like Jesus. We look at darkness. It should be looking at us and we respond like Jesus because we're hidden in Jesus now. This is an intimate, beautiful union. Psalm 91, verse 1. I'm going to read that. Today, guys, today, we want you to enter in to knowing how to make your relationship with God tangible. Let me tell you something. If you've been praying and you are not having a tangible time in the presence of God when you pray, you're not going to pray for long. There are way too many other things that are tangible in your life that you can just take on. Why would you want to keep doing something that you're not enjoying? <laughs> we're supposed to have this prayer life every single day, but we're not necessarily enjoying it. It's not tangible to us. So there are many things that are tangible, so it's no wonder why we are easily shifted and easily attracted to the things that are the most tangible. It is why we were created. It's not a bad thing. We are attracted to things that are tangible. And Jesus knew that. He didn't make it that we, he wouldn't be tangible. He actually formed a road path through the Bible that we'll go on today to show you how he is tangible and how to make him tangible in prayer. Psalm 91 says, he, whoever dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. There it is again. The secret place is actually has an address. It has a zip code. It is a fortress. It is a refuge. It is an actual building, a spiritual building that is created by your praise, by your worship, and by your intimacy with God that you can walk into and hide in. My God in whom I trust, surely he will save us from the fowler's snare, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover us with his feathers. This is what happens in the secret place. Under his wings, you'll find refuge. His faithfulness will be to you as a shield and a refuge and be your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night. Are you having issues sleeping? Do you have anxiety attacks? Listen, that is not God's best for you. He doesn't want you to be in fear of the terror by night. He doesn't want you to go to sleep knowing and fearing nightmares in your dreams. He doesn't want you to go to sleep fearing for people people in your family and for things that are going on and am I going to get sick and is this going to happen you see guys there is a quarantine zone that God keeps us in 24 7 if we're found in his secret place in other words we can walk around with a quarantine zone that is around us non-stop it's called the shelter of the most high God it's called the shadow of the almighty it is a place where no foul can touch you no pestilence can touch you no sickness can touch you this is your refuge. This is your place of safety. You'll not fear the arrow that flies by day. You know what that is? That's the words that people are saying. That's all the fears that people are speaking. That's all the vile things that people are saying and that's coming out and nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. You can't see coronavirus right now. You don't know exactly where it is. It's invisible, but we know it's out there. It's stalking. It's coming around. You, you don't know, uh, you know, if you go to the grocery store, if you come in your house, uh, you're not knowing where it is. It's, it's something hidden about it. It's mysterious and it freaks you out and feeling listen the thing that stalks you and that pestilence that comes around that that thing that lingers in the darkness no plague will touch you see Jesus you don't have to know where it is you got to know where Jesus is he's manifesting you and as long as you are hidden in the shelter you have no fear no fear no fear no fear if you're hidden in Jesus. No fear. I'm saying that to somebody in your house. No fear any longer. No fear anymore in the refuge and the shelter of the Most High God. Listen, all those promises in Psalm 91 are amazing. But listen, those are made for dwellers. Those aren't made for visitors. Visitors of the presence don't get all those promises. Dwellers get the promises. Those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. God wants you to set up your permanent address in His presence. Praise God. You see, Israel, we know in the Bible, 
There was a time when they went out into the desert and they were traveling to the promised land. They're in there for 40 years and God's providing food for them every day. But there was something about the manna. The Bible says that the manna ran out every single day. And if they tried to keep any of it from the day before, it would mold and it would get sterile and horrible. Why? Because God was trying to tell us that he wants us to know that we need a fresh word from God today. We need a fresh impartation of Jesus. We need a fresh time in his presence. And he's not going to let us survive on yesterday's bread. Abraham met with God in such a way that he was so connected with God and, and, and by his faith was actually accredited to him righteousness before Jesus could even be our righteousness. Before the cross, Abraham, he had a faith because he simply believed what God said, that he was in there. And the Bible said because he was on such a place, he got into a frequency. You know when you turn on the radio and you have a frequency, say, you know, it's 102.7, everything that comes across that airwave, you're not going to miss it. But you're not going to hear what's on 99.9. .9 because you're on the wrong frequency. See, Abraham got on the frequency of God because of his faith and his communion with the Lord, that there was a time when God was about to destroy a city called Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, how can I keep this from my friend Abraham? He's on the same frequency as I am. I can't keep it from him. So I might as well just go and tell him what I'm gonna do. And Abraham ends up talking God down from all of the things that he was gonna do to the city to talking him down to 10 people. Say, man, if you can just find 10 people. You don't believe that? You see, you can get on frequency with God. You won't miss anything the Lord's doing because you're returning to his presence. The Bible says that in the book of Acts that, that there were ministers that turned the world upside down. How did they do it? They were in the presence of God daily. Philip was walking and he said he saw an Ethiopian eunuch and, and he took him in the Ethiopian eunuch. I want to be baptized right here in the water. It said that he touched him. He dipped him under the water. And when he came up, Philip was translated right then. Bam, translated 55 miles away in order so he could preach because see he was with God in communion so he jumped off of man's timeline and he jumped onto God's timeline God didn't want him to wait for hours that he was going to have to walk 55 miles he said I need you to preach now so he translated him now you see if you're on God's timeline by being in his presence by staying close to him the Bible says we start to walk in step with the spirit meaning that there is a rhythm to, to walking with God there's a song like a beat that's always in the background of your heart that it's hard to explain but you're on this beat you're on this rhythm it's the heartbeat of God that you're in with that you're close to and see he was on this rhythm you see history is made in secret first let me say that again. History is made in the secret place first. If you will make history with God in secret, he'll make history through you to the world. If you'll make history with God in secret, he'll make history through you to the world. You see, there's this amazing scripture, Exodus 26, 30, Moses, and he's just taken the children of Israel out of the Egypt and he's taken to the promised land and he's up and he's fasting and the Bible said that he goes on a 40 day fast this is not just food this is food and water a 40 day fast from food and water how many of you know you're gonna die <laughs> if you don't drink water and you don't eat food for that long but he was surviving on something that many of us today have not been familiar with for too long he was feeding on God's glory for 40 days and 40 nights, he was feeding on the glory of God. And the Bible says that when he's there in the presence of God, God tells him, he says, listen, he shows him this entire thing called the tabernacle and he shows him a pattern. And he says, Moses, when you get out of my presence, because it was the 40th day, he says, you're about to step out of my presence. And he says, when you step out of my presence, he says, I want you to remember something what i told you when you were in my presence set up exactly to the pattern exodus 26 30 that i have shown you in my presence why did he have to remind him of that because moses was about to walk down the mountain and find that there was over 3.2 million people on average that they've estimated that were reveling and rioting against god and doing all kinds of sinful acts and that moses was about to lose his stuff he was about to get angry because of what was going to happen and he said, you're about to go to real, out to real life. You see, when you're in the secret place, you don't have fear. When you're with God, 
you, all the things that seem to be so pressureful and so huge, they don't bother you anymore. All the things that seem so insurmountable and all the things you're wondering how God is this going to work out and all the bills that you don't know how are going to get paid and all that, you start enjoying Jesus. You forget about all that in the presence of God. It doesn't matter anymore. You're like, Lord, I'm just here with you. I have you right now. This is all I need. You know what happens? You start reveling in Jesus and everything else fades away. The beautiful face of God becomes so clear to you that all the other things in your life seem so insignificant. But he said, once you leave my presence, Moses, you're going to get back to real life. Let me show you what happens. When we get into the presence of God, we are filled. But when we come out of the presence of God, we come back into real life. Meaning you come out of the presence, maybe it was your time you spent in the morning and your child is still sick. So you come out there and you notice you are filled with God, but all of a sudden you already, you already start pouring out. Your child's sick, but you're going to have faith. You're going to pray. So you just poured a little bit out. And then you come out and you know, your wife says something to you. She hasn't prayed that morning, maybe. <laughs> or you know, maybe it's you, maybe it's her, you know, whatever. She says something that really bothers you. So, oh, but you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to respond to that right there. I'm going to have patience to that. So you just pour a little bit more out. And then you go and you know, maybe uh, you have responsibilities at your job. And man, your boss is just really, <laughs> it's really going bad today. He's riding you today. Something's happened that's wrong. And the way he's talking to you, everything. Okay, so you're gonna have patience though. So you just pour a little bit more out. And you just pour more out with everything that goes on in your life. Oh, the guy just flipped you off on the road. <laughs> you didn't mean to swerve like that. You know what I mean? You're, hey, I'm sorry, sir. But man, before you knew it, there comes the finger. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it comes flying out before you can even say anything. Oh man, but I'm not gonna give it back. No, so I'm gonna... I pour it out. When you go back to life, you are emptied in life. But if you don't return, you are now running on empty. Meaning that it's no wonder while you're saying things to your family you don't like about yourself. It's no wonder that you're losing your temper. It's no wonder that things are going on in your marriage and you're arguing about things that you know are insignificant, that shouldn't matter. But it's a bigger deal than it should be because you're both empty. It's no wonder that you have doubts and fears and you're not full of faith. Why? Because faith only comes by hearing and hearing God's spoken word into your heart. You're empty. So you got to return. You cannot survive. You cannot function. <clears throat> You cannot function or survive without the presence of God. I'm going to walk you through now exactly what I do every single day, every single morning. And I'm not making these keys up, these steps into getting into God's presence. I want to make this very practical for you today. What I'm going to do is literally take you through the biblical steps of how to get into God's presence. God actually formed a path in the Bible. Ephesians 4, 19 through 21 is where we're going to start. It says, because of spiritual apathy... The people surrender their lives to lewdness, impurity, and sexual obsession. Let's stop there for just a second. The only times you notice that you're being tempted more than anything else, the only times that you notice that you're being overcome by doubt when you feel you should have faith or being overcome by depressing thoughts are the times in your life where you are spiritually lazy. Just look at it. Just mark it. Just, just try to take an observation of your life. And notice the times when things seemed the worst and the heaviest and all that. And, you know, you didn't like yourself the most, where you were the most tempted, where you found that you were falling to temptation the most. And you'll notice that it's usually times where you weren't close to Jesus, where you weren't making that step each day. It's times where you were, you were spiritually hungry. You were starving. You weren't in the word. You weren't in prayer. Things were going on. You see, it's the times of laziness. Apathy is what the Bible calls it, where we just are like, you know, Christianity is just another thing in our life and God's presence is just another thing. Jesus doesn't want to be another thing. He wants to be the thing. That's what he deserves, the place in our life. He loves you so much. You need him. You need his love. In a time when people are going crazy, in a time when coronavirus is going on, in a time where sicknesses are happening, when the government is all upheaval, when there are riots going on, listen, you need a hiding place. You need a secret place. You need a place you can get strength. You need a place where you know that God has you and that is found in his presence. Ephesians 4, 23 through 24. Now it's time to be made new by every revelation that's been given to you and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life union with him. Watch this. It's time to be made new by what? 
every revelation that's been given to you. So the only way that you actually fulfill everything God wants for your life, remember when you were young, you said, God, give me a purpose for my life. Give me a destiny for my life. Give me, give me, you know, the dreams of my life. God, show me what your dreams are. Show me what your destiny is. You remember those times when you did that? You know what was happening? You were praying because God does have a destiny, a purpose. He gave it to you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. He gave you that destiny and that purpose, but you will never actually fulfill it completely unless you get every single word God has for you along the way. It says being made new by every revelation that's been given. You see, God gives you a revelation enough for one day but then he wants to speak to you the next day and you need that revelation you need the one you're gonna get two years from now from five years from now six years from now but if we're not returning if we're not intimate with Jesus if we're not being close to the pearl of great price then you are stuck you are parking at the last word that you got maybe five years ago maybe six months ago but this is an ongoing revelation in other words when God's voice stops in your life when you stop hearing the audible the 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 inside audible the 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 live living word Ephesians calls it the living word that washes his church clean being washed by the washing of the word of God when that's not going on in your life the second it stops your progress towards your destiny stops God works through other people. God tries to get you back on track. God's mercy is so good. He'll work through other people to help you. You could go away from him for five, six, seven years. Is God still waiting for you when you come back? Absolutely. He never gives up on you. He's so patient with you. However, you have parked in a place and you're not going further. Galatians 2.20, this is so amazing. My old identity is crucified with Jesus. I no longer live. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine, for the anointed one lives his life through me. That's so powerful. We can't get into that today. But let me just say this one thing. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. When you look at my head, you see Gavin. When you look at my body, it's still Gavin. He's the head, we're the body. We're not something separate. This isn't just Jesus and now this is something separate. This is Jesus, this is Jesus. Meaning that if Jesus wants to move, he moves through us. It said he's living his life through us. If we don't go and walk over and touch him to be healed, Jesus can't walk over and touch him to be healed. If we don't go and talk to him to be saved and say he wants to love you, he encourages you, Jesus doesn't get the opportunity to go and say he encourages you and he loves you. He is literally restraining himself to his body. We have to do something as his body so that he can do something. And it says at the end of the verse, my new life is empowered by the faith of the son of God who loves me so much, he gave himself for me. And listen to this. He dispenses his life into mine. Where else does that happen but in the presence of God? He's dispensing himself every time you meet with him. You're taking another part of him. Matthew 4, 3 through 4. Now when the temper, tempter came to him, this is Jesus. He says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he said, it is written to the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That word proceeds means to continually come out. It's not just last Thursday. It's not just last Friday. Continually proceeds. Continually proceeds from God. You got to hear him again today. You got to get into his presence today. You got to allow him to touch you today. Continuously proceeds. John 15, four through eight. We know, and I'm not going to read all the verses. If you abide in me, and I abide in you. I'm the vine, you're the branches. You can do nothing without me. You cannot survive without Jesus. We read Psalm 91. It is for those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High God. Ephesians 2, 18 through 19, listen to this. And now because we are united with Christ, now we're gonna approach God now. This is what I do every day. Let's approach Jesus. This is how we approach him. You gotta know this in the back of your head in order to approach him every day. It says we are united with Christ. We and Jesus have equal and direct access in the realm of the Holy Spirit to come before the Father. Did you just hear what the Bible said? The Bible said that all the rights that Jesus has to come before God, his Father, we have the same right. We have as much right to be in the presence of God the Father now as the Son does to be in front of God the Father now. We have equal access rights. Wow. God doesn't, Jesus doesn't just go in there and speak his special 
password code and they open the door for him and it's not a password we know. No, the blood of Jesus is the password we get. And because we are covered in the blood, we look like Jesus. So we have direct access into the realm of God. Every day you can walk in knowing I have the exact amount of access. Well, Gavin, I screw up. Well, Gavin, I have sins in my life. Well, Gavin, I have issues. Listen, the blood of Jesus, once you can proclaim it and confess it over your life, makes you clean again every day. It renews you every day. And you have equal access, just like the son has to his son. This is so good. Ephesians 2.13. Look now, everything is made new. Although you were distant and far away, you now have been brought delightfully close to him through the blood of Jesus. You've been united with Christ. You see, the blood is our access. So what do I do when I come into the presence of God? Every day I come into the presence and I say, Lord Jesus, it takes seconds, seconds, not a long time. I just come and say, Lord, for all the sins that I know of, God, I just repent. Thank you, your blood cleanses me. God, for the ones that I don't even know of, for many ways I've, uh, whatever it might be, I just thank you, Jesus. Just cleanse me by your blood. You are not acceptable to God without the blood of Jesus. So you have to come in through the blood, but you do it in faith because you know you have equal access like Jesus does. But you just, you say, Lord, I just proclaim the blood over me right now. In Jesus' name, step two, watch how we're doing this. We're coming in through the blood. Ephesians 3, 16 through 17 says, I pray that he would unveil himself in his unlimited riches. Verse 17, then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released inside of you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Listen to this. We have been given all of these things. We're now sons and daughters of God. We've been given uh, equal access. We have all of these riches. In other words, we have a bank account that is full with an inheritance God has given us because of the cross. However, we're still depressed. We're still sick. We're still lonely. We're still, uh, you know, people are still contemplating suicide. There is such stuff that happens, but Lord, you said that I'm all these things. How come I still feel this way? Listen, it says right here, you have to constantly be using your faith. Faith in what? Faith in what God wrote on these pages. Faith on what God said in his word. You can't just have faith in nothing. You have to have faith in something and what you have faith in is what God already said. And by constantly using your faith, what has been made available to you now becomes accessible to you. You feel joy now. You feel better now. You feel hope now. You feel love now. You don't feel depressed anymore. Why? Because you've accessed what is already in your bank account through faith. But you got to use your faith. You literally use your faith every day in prayer. James 4, 8, this is amazing, or Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly to the throne room of grace. Hallelujah. We can come boldly because we know what? We have faith in the word that I just said that we have equal access just as Jesus does. So when you come to prayer every single day, don't come in timidly. Don't come in saying, you know what I just did last week. Don't come in just saying, God, you already know all the sins and being in shame and guilt. We waste too much time in prayer in shame and guilt. You got to come in boldly saying, I come in the blood of Jesus. I believe it's cleansing me right now. And I come in before you. God boldly because I have equal access like the son does. This is powerful. James 4, 8. Here's the next step. This will change your prayer life. Listen to this. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Did you hear what I just said? Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. That is not a suggestion. That is a promise from God. People enter into God's presence and they hope he shows up. That's why you're not tangibly having the experience with him because God did not want you to hope in it. He wanted you to know it was going to happen. You see, when I come into God's presence, I come in through the blood of Jesus because that's what the Bible tells me to do. I come in boldly knowing he will meet with me because he said, if you draw near, I will draw near to you. When you have faith knowing God will show up, not hoping he shows up, he manifests himself. Why? Because you believe what he said. I will draw near to you. This will change your prayer life. He'll manifest himself. Now, it says draw near to God, so we take the first step, then God draws near to us. But watch this, Song of Solomon 1.4 says, Lord, draw me away and then I'll run after you. So it seems like a contradiction. So God says, we need to take the first step. And then God says, I'm going to take the first step towards you. So what, what, which one is right? Well, let's get this in context. What's actually going on is Romans 5, 8. 
God demonstrated his love toward us. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. So in other words, just know that Jesus always took the first step. When you didn't care about him, when you didn't love him, Jesus took the first step to why you were still sinner, he came and he died for you on the cross. He took the first step for our relationship. He took the first step so that we could meet with him in prayer today. He took the first step. And now God's saying, draw near to me. It's not because we're taking necessarily the first step. What draw near to me means is show up. Show up in my presence today. If you would just make a commitment to be someone who shows up, God will do the rest. Be faithful to show up. Isaiah 40 verse 31. This is what we're doing now. We're in the presence of God. We've come in through the blood of Jesus. I know that he's going to show up. His tangibility is becoming real because I'm not hoping he will show up. I believe he's going to show up, right? And I believe that I'm taking the first step by showing up. Now watch this. Isaiah 40 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not go away. They'll walk and not faint. Those who wait upon the Lord. I've never even heard a sermon on waiting on the Lord. By I don't know of anybody. Those who wait upon the Lord. In other words, when you get into the presence of God, you have to wait for something. You're waiting for something. What are we waiting for? Stick with me. I'm about to show you. And then we're about to close. But this is the most important part. Don't lose me here. Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. You're waiting to be strengthened. You're waiting to be hope filled. But you have to have a tangible touch. You see, you could go in and pray for 30 minutes, but not have a tangible touch and you come out the same. But if you go in and then you're touched tangibly by God. What does tangibility mean? Tangibility means I taste him, I see him, I feel him, I hear him. If you have a tangible relationship with God, then when you go in, what happens? You are touched and now it becomes enjoyable. So Psalm 80 verse 18, this is everything right here. We are waiting to be, so will not we go back. Quicken us and we will call upon your name. Quicken me and then I'll call upon your name. Quicken me. What does quicken mean? Quicken means it's the moment you know that work stopped and God took over in prayer. Your striving ends at that moment. It's usually the moment you start to cry. It's that moment that the worship is going on and you just get so lost, all of a sudden you forget about things. There's a touch that happened. Maybe you've been worshiping and walking back and forth in your room for about 15 minutes or walking on the trail for about 15 minutes and nothing's been going on. You're just singing your songs, you're going, but all of a sudden that moment hits and all of a sudden the tears start flowing or maybe the faith all of a sudden rises up and you begin to pray prayers and it comes out of you that you're like, wow, what am I even praying? And you're praying for people you love and, and things are going on. There's this grabbing that's in you. There's this pull that's coming. That's the touch. That's the quickening. That's the moment that prayer turned from you just trying to work this up and saying, okay, Lord, I need your presence. I'm hoping you're going to show up to say, no, I know you're going to show up. So I'm just here. I'm waiting for you to quicken me. I, how do you wait? Well, there's two ways to wait. You can wait by worship. You can turn on the worship song. Maybe you have your phone and this is what I do every day. I go to my lake and I have 2.2 miles. I can walk around this lake right by my house and I walk around and I have some worship playing. I got my, my uh, headphones in my ears and I'm just walking along and I'm just worshiping the songs. And I love these songs, but I haven't necessarily felt the presence of God yet. So I'm waiting though. I'm waiting. Maybe it's three songs in. Maybe it's two songs in. Maybe, maybe it's five songs in. I'm willing to wait. And if you're not willing to wait, then you're not willing to let your relationship with God be tangible. You have to wait to be quickened. You got to wait to be touched. You got to wait for him, him's presence to come alive. See, Jesus said that he's omnipresent, but that didn't change your life just knowing God's there. He said, those who love me, my father will come and love him and we will manifest ourselves to him. You're waiting for manifestation. It's where the unseen becomes seen. It's where the untouched becomes touched. It's where you become enjoying God. You're actually feeling him. You're enjoying him. You're knowing him, but you got to wait in prayer to be quickened. You got to be willing to wait to be quick. And so you're playing the worship, you're walking along and all of a sudden, I don't know, something hits and in the middle of the fourth song, the bridge happens and all of a sudden, boom, there it is. Oh my gosh. And now you're not just singing, you're locked in. Something has shifted inside of you. You've been quickened. And the last way that quickening happens, and I'm going to tell you guys this and we're closing. This is it. The last way that quickening happens, never go into the presence of God without your Bible open. 
Never go into the presence of God without your Bible open. What do I do? So let me just review. I come in through the blood of Jesus. I walk in. I come in through the blood. Thank you, God, for your blood. I know that he's going to show up. He didn't say he would hope so. So I'm coming in knowing that God's going to show up. Therefore, I come in boldly because I'm coming through the blood. I have equal access like the son does and to the father. So I come in boldly knowing he's about to show up. So he starts to show up. I'm meditating on his greatness. I'm thinking about how awesome he is. Maybe I got some worship playing. You see, God doesn't need the worship music, but we need it for our atmosphere especially if you've had an intense day or a lot of stuff that's been going on to focus in it helps us focus sometimes just to turn on some worship and I do that but then I come in through the word what do you do with the word well you get the word and you open it let's give an example Psalm 23 verse 1 I'm literally going and listen the word what you're opening is Jesus so you're looking for the word to encounter Jesus. You're looking to be quickened by the word. Sometimes worship works. A lot of times it does. Sometimes you need the word of God. I would come in with both to always be clear that you're going to have a tangible time with Jesus. One of them's going to work every time. I'm telling you, every time one of them's going to work. So you're in there and the Bible's open and you just start reading. You're not reading for education. You're not reading so that you can memorize the scriptures. You're not reading so that you can say, I read the entire book of Psalms. You're reading to find Jesus. You're reading until you're quickened. So I'm starting to read, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Oh my gosh. When I read he restores my soul, something happens inside of me. I'm grabbed. In other words, there's something about when I read that that I need in my life. That scripture on that line, I needed that in my life. And because I needed that, I'm going to stop reading now. I'm not going to continue to keep reading the chapter. I'm not going to continue to keep going through the rest of the book. I'm going to stop. Because the purpose of why I am reading the scripture is to find the presence of God. So the presence of God, the scripture is giving me the presence of God. The scripture is giving me the prayer. So I look and he says, he restores my soul. Man, I'd love some restoration right now, Lord. Jesus. So I close the Bible and I just start, I literally start dwelling. It's like you sit in a pool of that scripture. So it says, you, he, dwell, he maketh me lie between green waters. Do you need some peace in your life? Oh, I'm just going to sit in that peace. Because you said it, God, I can have it. He restores my soul. Oh, Lord, I need some restoration right now. I've broken up. With my brother and I aren't talking or whatever's happening. It just leaps out to you. You get there. Don't keep moving on. You got to stop because now the word is manifesting the presence and the word has done its job. So you can close the Bible and you can now rest. You can swim around in that word. You can simmer in that word and the presence of God is developing and he's ministering to you about restoration. He's ministering to you about making you lie down beside still waters. You got to get still again. He's giving you peace for all the anxiety in your heart. Why? Because that was the place that Jesus was found today. Tomorrow it might be Isaiah 40. The next day it might be Song of Solomon 2. The next day it might be Hebrews chapter 5. You, you, it's all over. Pockets of the presence, those pools of Jesus himself are all over the Bible. But you got to be willing to wait to be quickened. You got to go into the, your prayer with your Bible open and you got to have worship going on so that he can quicken you. And the manifestation of Jesus is going to happen, I believe it, right through these screens. I'm going to pray for you right now that God would touch you with a manifestation of allowing his presence to become more real than you've ever felt. The secret place is your hiding place. The secret place is your secret hiding place. It is the safety you need. You will not be afraid there. You will be strengthened there. If you are weak today, we pray for you in the name of Jesus. That God will renew your strength. But the Bible says you will get renewed if you'll wait on him. I pray, God, that you would be putting burdens on people's hearts, that you'd be convicting people who are watching this from all over in their houses, from all over places, that they are being convicted, saying, Lord Jesus, bring me back to your face. Bring me back to your presence, God. I pray that there would be people in their homes getting on their knees right now. I just pray, just get on your knees right now. Just get on your knees right now. There's a presence that's coming through these screens, and he is inviting you to himself. It is the enjoyment of God that he wants. God created you so that he could enjoy you. The Bible says that he calls us his inheritance. 
We are his inheritance. Yeah, you see yourself as ugly. Yeah, you see yourself as having issues and you're not the best wife or the best husband right now. Jesus sees you as his inheritance. Are you grateful for that? Why don't you just get on your knees and start just thanking him for it? Just thank him for it. Just let the presence of God fill your home right now. Let it fill the room that you're in. Let it just fill the atmosphere that you're in. As it's filling this church building right now, I believe it's filling your home. It's filling you through the screens right now. God is drawing us to himself, back to the secret place. Are you willing to wait for him? He'll teach you. He'll show you. Come into prayer with your Bible open and let worship lead you in. Jesus, I thank you for encounters like they've never had before. I thank you this is a turning point for their life. I thank you this is a turning point for their prayer life. You see, when you begin to enjoy God's presence because it's tangible, you'll want to do it all the time. You'll never have problems showing up. You'll never have problems feeling guilty that you haven't prayed again this week. You just haven't been having a tangible time. That's why it's been hard for you to come back. But when it's tangible, you won't want anything the same. I'm going to pray for people who don't know Jesus right now. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know him, if you don't know him, you say, Gavin, this God you're talking about so intimately and so close, and I don't know him. I, I want to know him. Jesus died on a cross. He loves you so much. He did it for you. When he hung on the cross, even though there were thousands around, he saw your face. I want you to pray with me in your house right now. It's going to be a simple prayer, but I want you to know that being saved is not just a prayer. I want you to know the prayer I'm going to lead you into is just the first step. But truly being saved is a complete surrender of your life to God. It's saying, God, I'm no longer the boss, but you are. It's not enough just to say a prayer. We're going to introduce you to Jesus by saying this prayer, but now God's going to ask for your life. It's not going to be hard. It's going to be something he helps you with. It's a hard walk as far as things that you won't want to do. It will be against your selfishness and it will, it will take down your pride or relationship with Jesus. It will challenge the beliefs that you have. Absolutely, that's hard. But listen, Jesus is going to be there every step of the way. His presence will always be available. And anytime you want to say the passcode of the name of Jesus, oh man, anytime you want to praise him, that throne will come down in your house, in your car, while you're walking around, and he will make his habitation, the secret dwelling, the refuge, the strong fortress around you every step of the way. Say these prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, I need you. Wash me of my sins. I believe that you shed your blood on the cross for me. I believe that you rose again from the dead. God, I give my life over to you. I'm no longer the boss. You are. Tell me how to run my life. Tell me how to run my schedule. Make me new. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, we believe that you just got saved. We believe and we want to welcome you as a brother and a sister now into the family of God. We love you so much. Here comes Pastor right now. Wow, what a great word about spending time with God and having an encounter with God. And he was talking about being quickened. If we have an encounter with God every day, it's no longer going to be like, oh, I got to pray. I got to have some devotion time. You're going to get really excited. And it's really simple. What he was saying, first of all, draw near to God. And what he was saying is, he would just saying, just show up. That means have some time on a daily basis, even maybe in a place that you're saying, every day I meet up with God. And the, and the word of God promises us, if we show up, we draw close, he'll draw close. You know what that means? He's going to be there. And he said, don't spend time with all the guilt trip. You know, God, when Jesus gave his life, this is what he did. He shed his blood so all of our sins can be forgiven. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then he said, go in there with some worship songs. Listen to some songs. And it's not so much talking. At that moment, just be silent and let the songs minister to you. Maybe sing them, yes. And let God begin to touch you in that time. And then he said, also, open up your Bible. Have your Bible ready. Open up your word. And not read to read. Read to get a revelation from God. This is what happens. As you're reading, there's a word that pops out. The other day, I was reading the Bible just like that. 
And then there was a word, I was reading the book of Esther, and there was a word that came up, and, and there was a man named Mordecai that was trying to kill, no, there was a man named Haman trying to kill Mordecai, a Jew, a man of God, and he, it wasn't working. And then that man, Haman, his wife came to him, she goes, you know, because he's a Jew or because he's a man of God, what you're trying to do is not going to work. It's not going to succeed. And if you keep doing it, you're probably going to put your life at stake. And that's exactly what happened. And you know what God spoke to me at that? I just wrote that scripture down and just stopped right there. And this is what it said to me in that moment. It began to speak to me. Everything's going to be fine. It doesn't matter what weapons are coming against you. None of them will prosper. You're guaranteed to succeed. I go, whoa. And I went into that day experiencing victory after victory after victory. God has that for you. So if you just gave your life to Jesus, go on the website, igodsaved.com. And then you're going to take your next step. Remember, half the battle is showing up. If you just gave your life to Jesus, your next step, igotsaved.com, and we'll help you get baptized, get through some starting at the weight classes, and build a foundation in your walk. We love you. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy time with your family, and allow God to meet you where you meet Him. Love you. God bless you. Hello, everyone. What a powerful message. And on behalf of the Wayward Outreach, we just want to say, we love you. But most importantly, God loves you. And if that word spoke to you today, make sure you help us get this message out by liking, commenting, and sharing this YouTube channel. God bless you all. See you next time.